Picking up new craft hobbies and doing online retail therapy. That about sums up my 2020. With the world effectively shut down, Etsy has come out of 2020 as one of its biggest winners. It had a meteoric rise in its stock price from $45 to $178, a nearly 300% increase in 2020. Revenues went from $819 million for all of 2019 to $1.1 billion in just the first three quarters of 2020. This projects out to nearly $1.5 billion for the full year. This begs the question, with all its steps taken to grow and adopt practices of other massive online marketplaces, is Etsy still the Etsy we know? Has it moved too far from its core user base, and what will that spell for them going forward? The underlying idea behind Etsy is that they're an online marketplace that doesn't offer standardized consumer products. Instead, by being focused on handmade or vintage products, as well as unique factory products, Etsy gives skilled people an ideal platform to showcase their creativity and make good money. And the other side of this coin is true as well. Buyers come to Etsy looking for unique and handmade products. They don't come for mass-produced goods that they can find easily elsewhere. With its push to get bigger and bigger, will Etsy be able to keep its identity or has it already begun alienating their core user group? Gone are the days where the majority of the products I see on Etsy are handmade. For every unique handmade good I find, I'm bombarded by multiple listings of AliExpress products disguised as handmade goods. If you've ever looked for jewelry on Etsy, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So while today Etsy is still the undisputed king of handmade goods e-commerce, can it continue being what it is while trying to adopt similar business practices as Amazon and eBay? Well, in the short term, definitely yes. No other site has this type of reach and promotion as Etsy. And for the most part, all of these practices have been working successfully for growing Etsy. The closest competitors in the small seller space are Shopify and Big Cartel, but they don't operate the same way Etsy does. They're not really set up like a marketplace, but more like a build your own e-commerce site type of environment. So users would typically need to drive their own traffic and promote their own products. For a fee, online marketplaces provide many advantages over starting your own website. Sellers need no technical knowledge and can quickly launch just by creating an account. You immediately have access to advertising tools that these platforms have at their disposal, and there's already an existing customer base searching on these sites. Let's go over how it all began. Etsy was founded in 2005 with the vision to create a business that would function as an online platform for craftsmen to sell their goods. The motivation behind this came from Rob Kalin, one of the founders. Kalin was an amateur furniture maker and had difficulty marketing the wood encased computers he produced. The idea was that a group of sellers would generate more interest from potential buyers than people trying to sell their handmade goods on their own. And he was right. Fun fact, the owners have often dodged the question of how the name Etsy came to be in its early days, stating that it just sounded nice and catchy. But Kaylin has come out and said that Etsy can be interpreted in French and Latin as what if, and in Italian as a variation of SC, meaning oh yes. But what he really wanted was a gibberish word that didn't come with any biases attached to it so that customers can view it with an open mind. It's kind of like Google, except, well, you know, Google's a word. So they decided to launch rapidly and were online within two months, but had to solve their biggest problem, getting both buyers and sellers signed up. Etsy had a team attending arts and craft shows across the US and Canada almost every weekend. Getting offline and out into the craft fairs wasn't an accident. At these events, the teams would often find influential artists and crafters and buy them lunch or give them craft show kits and other promotional materials. They knew that if those sellers signed up on Etsy and were successful, others were sure to follow. 
Many of these sellers had little to no e-commerce presence prior to Etsy and were thus very highly motivated to send their buyers to this site, so they killed two birds with one stone here. Another factor that helped with their early adoption was word of mouth sharing from feminist bloggers. The crafting community at the time, and even now, is highly skewed towards women. These bloggers use crafting as a form of expression and rejection of mass-produced culture. The community had been waiting for a platform for their niche, and eBay was too broad of a marketplace and had high fees, so they welcomed Etsy with open arms. The company's ability to connect with, empower, and ultimately leverage the feminist movement at the time provided them the early traction they would need to grow. By 2007, two years after launch, Etsy was close to reaching half a million registered users, who generated 26 million in annual sales. 2007 also marked the year that Etsy had its millionth sale. Still, the company had yet to turn a profit due to the large overhead needed for employee costs, site maintenance, and continuous technology enhancements. By 2010, the Etsy community grew to 5 million registered members, and it had a business valuation of $100 million. But things were slowing down. Etsy had not been growing fast enough and was still bleeding money. The board was growing impatient. In 2011, Kaylin was replaced as CEO with Chad Dickerson at the insistence of the board of directors. Dickerson was tasked to bring Etsy into a period of explosive growth. He reorganized the company and set out on a mission to inspire staff to work diligently and increase productivity. It was in, under his direction that Etsy went public in 2015, gaining a B certification as well. Cuts were made to lessen overhead, and through his positive reinforcement, things did appear to improve to a degree, but it would prove to be less than the board expected. The company was still showing a negative return at the end of 2015. While investors were excited by the growth potential of the platform, it didn't escalate as fast as they expected, and in 2017, the company's CEO was once again replaced. His replacement, Josh Silverman, has been far more comfortable making changes that are focused on raising the company's bottom line. Just prior to his appointment as CEO, 80 staff members were laid off. Under Silverman, revenues rose by 50%, and the financial picture was looking better, and Etsy saw their first year of profitability. But employee morale had dropped and many felt that the work environment and company culture had shifted for the worst. Under Silverman's leadership, the company has made drastic changes over the past few years, changes that have driven many sellers to leave Etsy. He's killed one of the core tenets of Etsy, transitioning from a policy of limiting sellers to only listing handmade and vintage goods to allowing sellers to list quote-unquote handmade items with the help of manufacturers. This reason alone is why we're seeing so many listings on Etsy that we're not interested in. There have been a plethora of policy changes that seem to be focused on bleeding sellers dry. They implemented a an automatic advertising program, not allowing sellers to opt out of ads and collecting those fees from them. On Etsy forums, sellers called it unconscionable, outrageous, and absolutely absurd. They told sellers that if they didn't offer free shipping on orders over $35, that their products would get dinged in search and in ads. The free shipping charge meant that sellers often had to raise prices to compensate or eat the extra cost. As small businesses, this wasn't an easy pill to swallow. One Etsy seller said shipping her small items across the U.S. could cost more than a couple of dollars. Because her products only cost around 20 bucks, she didn't feel comfortable raising prices, so instead she just absorbs the shipping fee and makes a smaller profit. Another seller said she refused to implement free shipping because she didn't want to raise prices on her customers. How much of a jerk would I look like if I started to offer free shipping, yet they see my prices went up a couple of dollars? My customers aren't stupid. As a result, the seller says her sales from Etsy search have plummeted. Other not-so-popular changes over the years include raising Etsy's fees for the first time ever from 3.5% to 5%, while also taking a cut of shipping fees too, and requiring all stores to use its own payment system where it can take transaction fees rather than letting them go through PayPal.
But in terms of bottom line, the changes seem to be working. Etsy's 2019 revenue was nearly double what it brought in during all of 2017. And that's all that matters, right? So we've gone full circle back to 2020 now. The world being shut down has been a huge boon to Etsy. Although its growth has been fantastic, Etsy needs to remember who it is as a company before it alienates its sellers, before a competing platform fills its niche. Here are just a handful of Etsy alternatives. Handmade at Amazon? Might as well, it's got the convenience of Amazon. Instagram Marketplace? Perfect platform to share the pics of your crafts, so why not also sell them there? Then you have direct competitors like Not on the High Street and Just Artisan, and many more trying to be what Etsy originally was. When so many of your core sellers are saying things like, I really don't trust the people who run Etsy not to find a way to punish shops who speak out, or to tell you the truth, I'm actively looking for another place to sell. One has to wonder where Etsy will be five or 10 years down the road if they continue down this path. You could say that Etsy's current practices are what's led to its profitability, but the truth is many startups don't see profitability for many, many years in an effort to constantly grow. That's pretty much the norm now in Silicon Valley when you look at the Ubers of the world. One can argue that Etsy had built all the framework it needed to eventually become profitable and that simply cutting costs would have brought them there instead of having to go through all these drastic changes. Perhaps the growth in revenue due to these new policies will ultimately be unhealthy for Etsy and be the cause of its downfall. With such short periods in their leadership positions and compensation so highly tied to stock price, it's no wonder why most CEOs will opt for short-term growth at all costs. But Will it cost them everything?